<laughs> okay, so discuss Luke's research, uh, winning 150. So I'm just going to run through the format of the event. So it's going to be like an interview, and then we're going to have Q&A with everyone here. And you can, ask face, you can ask questions on the Facebook as well. Um, so I'll do like a quick intro. So I'm Amy Dwyer, Chair of the Young Fabian Education Network and the University of Manchester Group. And we're joined by Luke's, uh, sorry, Luke Rakes, who's the Research Director for the Fabian Society. If you want to introduce yourself. Candidate. I'm Luke Rakes, I'm Research Director for the Fabian Society. I've been working for the Fabians for about 18 months now, so I started just before uh, that lockdown came in. Uh, I'm also a councillor here in Manchester, I've been doing that for about nine years as well, and as you might fancy, that's helped inform some of the research that we do. And um, as Amy said, I authored a paper called Winning 150, which we're here to talk about today. Awesome. Um, so the first question would be quite broad, if that's okay. Um, so what led you to carry out this research? So. The Fabian Society's research team has quite a unique role um, amongst think tanks because we are affiliated to the Labour Party. Um, and so, unlike the sort of independent think tanks, we are deliberately, explicitly pro Labour and we want Labour to win an election. So, that sort of determines quite a lot of the work that we do. Even when we do policy work, we like to get into the weeds of policy and figure out how things could work a bit better. We usually have one eye on how popular that will be with the public and sort of try to tie those things together. But we have a whole stream of work really designed to help Labour to win an election, um, which is uh, harder <laughs> than it might otherwise be at the moment. Um, but I think I was particularly keen on, on this piece of research um, because it does ask that big question. Um, how does Labour actually win the next election? Um, and so we're halfway through um, the Parliament potentially, depending on when that next election is called. And there's been obviously uh, we've been reeling for a number of years, really, from that, that, 20, that uh, December 2019 election result, um, and obviously through a pandemic and so on. It seemed like a really good time to be asking that question. I'm also conscious there's quite a lot of, I wouldn't quite call them myths, but some, some misleading uh, or partial arguments, some pieces of the jigsaw that people often focus on, whether that's just winning back the red wall or winning over this blue wall that people talk about. And while those are important, I'm sure we'll come to, um, they are just pieces of the puzzle. We need to look at the whole picture. And so we were really keen to set out that whole picture uh, and look at it also in quite a complex sense. So not, not to just sort of brand places as leave or remain, but to look at the full spectrum from leave to remain, but also working class and middle class, and also looking at the different trends and so on in those places. So to get into some of the detail of it, but then also to step back, and this is the hard bit, to step back and try and find some clear messages amongst was quite a complex situation and sort of point at least trying to point the way forward for Labour to win the next election. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there's quite a big trend of just saying this area is leave or this area is working class, yeah. and actually it's, it's quite more nuanced than that. Um, so how did you conduct this research? What was your kind of methodology? So firstly, we spoke to people who know these things better than we do, which is always a good start. <laughs> um, so a lot of academics and sociologists and people, and we read a lot of their papers to, to get started. and. Um, as you'll see from the report, there's like 10 different, I guess, dimensions or 10 different themes that we look at. And we wanted to make sure we got the right 10 and make sure we were looking at the right things. So for those of you who are on Twitter, I see that's most of you these days, you'll see sometimes everyone's starting to talk about deprivation in the Labour Party or they talk about class in the Labour Party or home ownership in the Labour Party and all these different things. So we sort of pieced all that together and then went through a process of, you know, testing that a little bit with, with, with a few people to make sure we were looking at, at the right things. Um, and then, of course, uh, we got we hit the spreadsheets and uh, did, did a lot of the analysis. It's, it wasn't you know, nothing particularly advanced, as you'll see from it, but you know, just just Microsoft Excel, which is which is always uh, always good and, and simple. Um, but making sure we analysed these the complexity of places, not just as you say in a binary leave remain, working class, middle class, but looking at the full spectrum of those places, and then getting down into the weeds of some of that data and trying then to present it in a way which is as clear as possible, um, which I think we should try to do. I don't know if we achieved it, you tell me, but we tried to present it in, in as clear a way uh, of that complex situation allows for. Yeah, I mean, I think you did that quite clearly. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you're a counsellor. Did, did being a counsellor kind of provide you with any insight that helped guide the research? Yeah, I mean, just generally, I think it's, it is helpful to have sort of the grounding um, in being a counsellor, particularly in, in a working class community. and. Um, over my career as a council, which started in 2012, which is almost 10 years ago, we've seen Labour's vote share sort of slip away in a similar way to, to in so-called red wall seats and in uh, heartlands or long-term Labour seats, whatever you want to call them. A lot of people not showing up to vote very often. 
and a lot of disaffection with the party and a lot of the discussions around Brexit and so on. But what it also helps to understand, I suppose, is that places are complex and, you know, it's, it's important not to write off one place as being, just because the majority of people there are leave voting, it doesn't mean that it's a leave place. And, and even if they did vote leave, that's not the definition of who they are. So you start to understand a bit more of the complexity about people and about the places that you represent. And within sure where my ward is, is, is one of those places which, you know, gets often branded as just a, a sprawling council estate and people associate it often with the second white population, but actually it's quite diverse. And there's quite a lot of private sector housing these days, quite a lot of middle class people too. So it, it is it is more complicated. And I think the representing a place and getting to know a place from that perspective is quite helpful to inform what ends up being a load of number crunching uh, to sort of have that sort of perspective, which is often um, you know, a bit more nuanced and more personal. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask a question, which I'm available if you've got it. Um, what were your main findings, or how can we win back the heart? I mean, I probably couldn't tell you exactly how to win because it is a huge task. And what we wanted to do with this piece of research is to sort of get a measure of that task, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it does lead in a sort of general direction, which we'll come to, but I suppose the main message um, is, as we say, that there's a mountain to climb. It's a very big mountain. It's about 150 seats um, that Labour will need to target and to win most of them in order to form a government. Of course, there's a difference between forming a majority government and being the largest party, uh, or indeed depriving the Tories of a majority. Um, and we, what we suggest is rather than focusing on one grouping of seats, uh, the Labour takes quite a broad approach because no one group of seats really works for the party. So just the red wall doesn't work, just the blue wall doesn't work, just the swing seats doesn't work. You actually need to look at the broad swathe of seats and try to win as many of them as possible. So it lends itself to a broader approach. And so I'll just go run through each of the different um, types of seat that we sort of categorise them. Very conscious that they're diverse within these categories, but you, know, you do need to sort of look at the places from that perspective. And we categorise them by their political history, because that's usually a good indicator of where they're gonna vote in the future. It's not everything, as, as we all know all too well, um, but it is a good starting point for, for understanding which way things are going to go. And the first category um, we look at is uh, long-term Labour, or formerly loyal Labour seats, as we call them. A lot of these are in the so-called Red Wall. There's about 41. And just to understand what the red wall is, because a lot of people sometimes misunderstand it, this was an analysis of seats North, West Midlands and North Wales um, that um, pollsters, academics, um, people on the right in particular, judged to be, all things being equal, they should have voted Conservative, but for some reason they were voting Labour. So there's these Labour seats in, in the North, especially where there's a kind of a culture or a history of voting Labour, which meant that those places voted Labour in 2017 and before, um, but in 2019, obviously the Conservatives capitalised on that, using Brexit to sort of prize those people away from Labour in order to win. So that is a big part of the, of the, of the challenge. The second group of seats are the, um, you know, the, the Conservative held seats, really sort of quite quite distant from uh, from the Labour Party. Um, they are moving slowly in our direction. The lost them are in the south. Um, but they're still quite a long way away from us, and a lot of these are what you might call uh, blue wall. It's not a term I really like, because the ones that Labour should be targeting aren't really in a wall as such. They're, they're kind of smattered around the country. Um, and really, as I think you had John Curtis do some with you uh, not so long ago, um, and he's written that actually that's probably a better target for Lib Dems rather than Labour. And to be honest with you, good for Labour if the Lib Dems take a few of them, because it helps take that Tory majority down a little bit. So it's not to say that Labour couldn't win some, and hopefully will win some of those places. Um, it's appealing to think about depriving people like Ian Logan Smith of, of a seat um, for all of us, and obviously that will, I'm sure, be an attraction for a lot of campaigners. But really keeping your eyes on the prize, that is not going to, to do enough. And in the long term, and people look at American politics and think, look, something similar is happening over here, demographic change, Georgia, for example, we think that might happen over here. Of course, yeah, but that might take 10 or 20 years. Um, of course, that would be brilliant when it does happen, but we shouldn't be banking on it. And we also need to be aware, of course, that people who voted Labour or didn't vote Conservative, rather, in the, the last election in those seats have very little in common with Labour other than leave and remain, other than being on the Remain side of that divide. So they're often quite centrist or right in economic terms. So there is, it's not like there's a whole load of seats in the South and there's Blue Wall that Labour can easily win. It's a long, hard 
chance to actually get any of those. I think as well, I spend a lot of time on this because I, I, I feel the appeal that people think, oh, there's some Remainers in the South and we can win loads of seats. I'm afraid it doesn't work like that. They are more complex than being just Remainers and there aren't enough seats in that group. But then there's a whole chunk of seats, we say, which are, well, there's a small group which are swing seats, about 17, which have changed hands more than once over the last um, sort of 15 years. And um, this is leaving Scotland aside all of this, by the way. There are 17 of those which you'd expect to be able to win. They've got relatively small swings, and they've sort of bounced between Labour and the Conservatives since 2005. Um, and then there's a whole other load of seats, about 34 of them from memory, um, which are uh, basically seats we've won in 2005. We haven't won since, but actually we don't do too badly in them. We often come quite close. So actually we're around the same sort of, if you look at Labour's majority in those places compared to the majority nationally, we're about in the same place we were in 2005 when we won them. So there's there's some sort of low-hanging fruit there. Um, and then, of course, there's Scotland. And a lot of people start with Scotland and then finish in Scotland because it's like there's no point looking at the rest of the country because we can't win without Scotland. And I think there's some, there's some truth to that. Labour doesn't need to, to win Scotland in order to win. Um, and yes, no doubt, they are quite hard to win, those seats. They've got some quite formidable majorities. I suppose in terms of crumbs of comfort or perhaps clutching at straws, there are some seats which went to Labour in 2017 for all sorts of reasons. Um, so about six of those went to Labour in 2017. But then all the 19 others that we looked at, they, they took 25 in total, so six plus, plus 19, um, they were within 4,000 of Labour winning. So the majority of the SNP in 2017 were 4,000 or less. So that's not as sort of forbidding as, as, as it might seem it is still very, very difficult. And what the conclusions that we come to are effectively that Labour needs to focus on a broad range of seats with different political histories, um, and also particularly look at what defines them and makes them slightly different, which is that they're most often not metropolitan. So 95 of them are towns or villages. Um, a lot of them, about half of them, which is quite a large proportion when you look at it, are towns that aren't adjacent to cities. So places like Wrexham, places like Worcester and so on. So those are places um, which have a particular dynamic to them, and that's something that Labour needs to work on too. Um, a lot of these seats tend to lean towards leave a little bit. They leave, they're sort of the, the skew of, of seats when you look at their distribution tends to lean towards leave, tends to lean towards so-called C2 and DE voters, which people will know are sort of the kind of lower working working class and lower working class uh, groups of people and state pensioners and so on. Um, so they do lean slightly that way, but not to be exaggerated, it's not like Labour just needs to win back all the working class vote and then it'll be okay. The Conservatives have done very well winning that vote and it's much more complicated than that too. So in terms of what Labour needs to do, generally speaking, we say not to aim for the extremes, not to sort of try and win back all the working class people, for example, not to just go after the lead vote, but to aim for a common ground, not necessarily the sort of left-right centre ground, that's a different thing, but to look for what these places have in common, which as we say, a lot of them are towns, um, but also, given that a lot of them are towns, um, it, it will be quite important for Labour to have a sort of positive regional agenda. So some kind of positive response to levelling up that isn't just sort of um, the risk is, I suppose, that Labour looks like they want that agenda to fail rather than wanting it to succeed. And that obviously they're, they're very alive to that and have been engaging quite positively with it locally here in Great Manchester as well as uh, nationally. But you know, need to, they need something alternative to say to a lot of those places because we know that the reason people voted to leave in those places and then look to Conservative in those places and want this levelling up agenda to succeed is because they feel like the place they live is in decline. Um, and that's a familiar story to lots of people who live across the north outside of major cities. So really important for Labour to have some you know, realistic but hopeful message for those places. So in a nutshell, I hope in a nutshell, in a nutshell that is, uh, that's what we would find with our research. Yeah, um, so before we kind of go deeper into the research, um, just have one last broad question. Are there any, any of your findings that surprised you? I was surprised by the 2005 seats, in fact, um, as in the ones that we, we won in 2005. There are quite a lot of them, and they're not as far away as you might expect, so they're out there. Um, it's, I mean, I wasn't surprised by the scale of the challenge, I think we all know that quite well, but we were particularly looking for um, groups of seats that weren't discussed very much. And I think we used to talk about swing seats a lot more than we used to and swing voters a lot more than we used to. Um, 
nowadays Labour just seems to be very focused on winning back the red wall or sort of consolidating something in, in, in the blue wall. But we'd also need to think about your sort of median vote, your swing vote, and, and arguably, you know, those people haven't really had anything that they wanted to see from Labour for a long time. So you could argue that there is something if we have a different offer and a different agenda now, that maybe there is something latent there that we could draw on. So suppose a tiny bit of hope, but not too much. We know that's dangerous. Um, certainly I do. I've been involved in politics since 2010 and not really ever worked on a, uh, a winning election campaign, as probably most of you here um, found as well. It's quite dispiriting after a while. You kind of don't want to hope too much, I suppose. No, absolutely. Um, I think there's definitely a point there about focusing too much on the red wall and then sort of ignoring everything else. Um, so you spoke about sort of the more rural communities that we need to try and target. How can we change our strategy from being seen as just a party of the urban voter and make inroads in these communities? So I think it is really important, um, first of all, that you know, Labour does need to be a party of the whole country. And I think people sometimes think, um, whether it's class, whether it's geography, whatever it is, that the party pulled in different directions and sort of needs to pick one. Um, but actually parties only win elections, certainly in this country and other countries as well, even whether it's proportional representation, by having quite a broad appeal to different people and finding what they have in common rather than sort of focusing on a narrow group of people to, to actually win. And that applies geographically as well as, 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 in, as in other ways. And so um, we find there's about uh, 50 seats which is with a significant rural population in fact. Um, so that's not that they're rural places, but there's a significant proportion of people who live in those seats, who live in a rural community, because obviously constituencies can, can be quite large. And I think Labour has often appeared to sort of not even want those people's votes. So I suppose that's the first thing, <laughs> is, is to at least um, show that you do want those people's votes. And actually the party's doing that relatively well. Um, and you know, a picture says it's worth a thousand words, and Keir Starmer in wellies is worth uh, <laughs> many thousands of words, I think, for, for that agenda, just to show and to speak to the NFU and to speak to those communities um, and sort of be open and listening to those communities. It's a really, really good start because it's not something we've done as much as we should do in recent years. I think Luke Pollard's work on the Rural Review um, and the work he's doing, he's been a very, very good champion, as, as, I've, as I've seen uh, in person in, in panel events. So he's a really strong champion for rural communities. And it is really important to have someone to take the lead on that agenda as well. But what we find when we look at um, voters in rural communities is that, as you sort of expect, they tend to be places where the people who don't vote Labour are more concentrated. So people who are homeowners, older people, middle class people and so on, they're concentrated there. And even so, even the younger people in those constituencies tend to like Labour less than younger people elsewhere. So there's a real is a real challenge in, in lots of rural communities. And while it's important not to sort of overly focus on the group of seats, which, which, are, which are not many, um, it will be important for Labour to present a sort of unifying message. I've strayed away from terms like One Nation, for example, in part because of, you know, <laughs> we know where that ended, um, but, but also um, because the UK isn't One Nation, and I say that as a Welshman. There, you know, when when the Middle came out with One Nation um, uh, back in the day, that there was some feedback, I think, from Scotland. Um, that's you know, that's not when I actually in in that sense One Nation, or at least it's not a very strong message in all parts of, of the UK. But that sort of you know that sort of thing, without calling it that, is is quite important. And unless you are trying to speak to all of the country. Uh, and look like you are the party for all the country, even if it all doesn't vote for you, people elsewhere don't get the sense that you're serious about leaving the country. So, so it's not just about those rural communities, it's also about other places and, and it's sort of looking like a party for the whole country, not just for a narrow part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think part of it's probably making policy that appeal to different groups that is the same policy. And I think yeah. that's something we've probably struggled with recently. Um, so you talk a lot about Scotland. Effectively. Um, so if the reasons for voting SNP are more complex than just a pro-independence vote, how can we kind of pitch ourselves as an alternative for Scottish voters? This is it's a tricky one, and um, I, I think from outside, so I'm very sensitive to the fact that I'm not based in Scotland, not, not an expert on Scotland and Scottish politics, and I think it's quite important to say that from outside, all I can say is, um, or repeat what people from Scotland tell me very often, um, and that is, yes, I think there is a case to be made, and um, Labour colleagues in Scotland often make it quite powerfully, but they'll say things like the UK has 
two terrible governments, one in Westminster and one in, in Holyrood. Um, and there's a, an understandable frustration about the SNP's record of delivery um, in Scotland, particularly when they're asking for more powers, not really using the powers that they've got very often, centralising powers from communities in Scotland, which, which, doesn't, uh, which isn't very progressive at all. And I think also, to be, to be honest, I think, um, understandably, um, I think when people in the rest of the UK um, look at Scotland and see something which on the surface looks quite progressive, to people living in Scotland, particularly for Labour, it doesn't look so progressive. Uh, they're not really doing a very good job in terms of health and education and so on. There's some really dire performance in terms of just delivering public policy up there. It was really important for us outside of Scotland to listen to Scottish Labour um, and take a lead from them in terms of dealing with it. And as they rightly say as well, while there is, you know, I don't know the latest figures, there's quite a relatively even break between uh, yes, um, to, to independence and remaining within the UK, um, that people on the yes side differ in terms of how big a priority it is and when they would like to see that referendum. And that's, that is, in a sense, something that the SNP are managing to, to manage at the moment, um, but does sometimes come up as a bit of a tension. Um, so it will be very tricky for, for Scotland to say that other people have the view that, perhaps other people in Scotland have the view that perhaps need to be more vocal in being pro-union. Um, Gordon Brown is doing some work on being more vocally pro Great Britain, um, I think, as part of his commission on the UK's future. So trying to understand that obviously do better to, to do such a thing, but um, you know, tr trying to make a positive case for what the UK is, or what Great Britain is, um, is, is really, really important. Um, and to have an offer in terms of policy which speaks to that, which is, as, for, my, for my point of view, needs to be some form of federalism, essentially. I say that as a, as a personal view. Um, you know, I think that is, in a sense, we are federalising as a UK from a Welsh perspective, um, as much as from a Scottish perspective sometimes. England is a thorny issue in that whole picture because obviously it's 85% of the population, uh, a very big country um, without the structures within it um, and quite tricky political issues to, to get through if you do want to build structures in England. So it's a very, it's a fiercely difficult task, but Labour is looking into that looking into how to offer something that's sort of for the UK while also dwelling calm within England and to the, to the nations. And I think that's got to be a big part of what Labour offers to Scotland, but as well to, to England, to the North especially, a sort of offer of devolution to across the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned time before younger voters, and I guess this kind of intersects with rural communities, I guess all of it as well. Um, how can we make gains with older voters without alienating younger voters? I think, I mean, there's a point I've sort of repeated it many times in many ways, is that like sometimes we feel like there's a tension when there isn't necessarily one. Um, and it's Labour like, just needs to look for a common ground. The Conservatives have built a coalition of very different people. And sometimes we should learn from them in the way that they've done that. Um, you know, it's not like the Conservatives are all Leave voters, not the Conservatives are all Northerners or Southerners or anything like that. And they're not all elder people either. You know, there's plenty of younger people, although it's a majority. Um, of young people that do vote for Labour, plenty do still vote Conservative, and they need those as well. So I think that's the first point, is not to feel like there's an insurmountable problem or an intractable issue when there isn't necessarily one. Um, but perhaps most importantly, and I do see this sometimes, it is, it is understandably frustrating to look at how many older people consistently vote Conservative and to think, well, we might as well just not even bother. I think sometimes I get that impression, certainly I've seen it, again on, on social media that like what's the point of even trying with people over the age of 50 and if you look at Labour Together report which I recommend going back to because it's been it's been a couple of years since it's published but it remains quite relevant the Labour Together election review um, looked at this and looked at the sort of change over time in the polarisation by age and the sort of as you, as you can tell very clearly from from that analysis um, you know, there is a really sharp really sharp crossover point which I think is now in sort of late 30s at the point at which people are more likely to vote uh, Conservative than Labour. It dropped by about 10 years between 2017 and 2019. To some extent, that does show how it can change. Um, but the, the point, the main point is that Labour can't win without all the voters. You can't. It's, it's statistically almost impossible to win, in part because of differential turnout, um, also because of geography, uh, and also because older voters tend to be voting conservative and we need that. <laughs> they're, worth, they're worth twice twice as much if they're conservative and if, 
and a conservative facing marginal, which they all are effectively apart from Scotland. So all the voters, it's not like, it's not an option. It, it just isn't an option. And um, so I think that's the most important thing. Sometimes it's less about policy and we can talk about policy offers, about triple lock and about sexual care and all sorts of things which might be beneficial to older people. I think again, particularly looking back at the last 10 years, it's important uh, not to offend those people as we sometimes have done um, and to look at what they, they care about. They often care about things like fiscal credibility and they are often put off by uh, anything seeming to be non-patriotic, for example. And you know, regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong with the different nuances around that, we know that that is the case. That those, those groups of people are particularly put off by those things. And of course, the party is moving in the right direction on both of those, often to derision from certain quarters and often to a mockery from others. But, uh, you know, it's that that is absolutely essential just to even get a hearing in terms of policy. Um, Labour does just need to open the door to those voters and say, we actually, we're not offending you, the first point. Um, and, you know, we're open to talking about some of the issues. And I think just mathematically, while you look at these things, I think more than 70% of the of People over the age of 80 vote conservative or people over the age of 70. It's, it's really quite sharp. But moving those percentage points, just a couple, does change the maths quite significantly because they all vote conservative. They all vote consistently. So it's not like it's less of a gamble. Um, and they're all really well placed in, the, in terms of geography. So just nudging those numbers down a little bit, I would very, very unlikely, perhaps never going to win a majority of all the people, but if we can learn less, uh, if we win less of a minority of all the people, if that makes sense, if we can take away from the Conservatives majority among all the people, it does make quite a big difference to, to the maths about how we actually need to win. Yeah. No, there's a lot of like, you know, insert flag joke um, and like culture war stuff, but I think the stuff where what kind of seems to be unpatriotic quite easily turns into like a culture war issue and the Tories are seen to do quite well on that. Yeah. But also I think it's important to mention that like Twitter is not the real world as well. <laughs> like I mentioned the word workshop and she didn't even know what it was. And I thought everyone knew what it was. So I think stuff like that as well, we kind of get a bit too distracted with. Um, so last kind of question for me. Um, you talked about how the Tories kind of gained from from Brexit. So given that the Tories have suggested making the next election about Brexit, how can we make sure this doesn't happen? It's a tricky one. And I think um, one of the starting, starting striking things about 2019 um, is, is actually non-voters or 2017 non-voters. And there's a school of thought, if you're familiar with it, that's basically the thing about non-voters, they don't vote actually. They often do show up to vote, they just don't vote the way that Labour often wants them to. And in 2019, a lot of them, about half of them, voted Conservative. About 4 million people voted new in 2019 who didn't vote in 2017. And a lot of people didn't vote in 2019 who did vote in 2017. So there's quite a lot of cheer in the non-voters um, category. And the reason I say that is because that was, does appear that that is quite a strong Brexit-related um, phenomenon. A lot of people following through on their 2016 vote to keep the Conservatives, to not to keep the Conservatives in, but just to sort of see Brexit through and, as we know, get Brexit done, which sent a shiver down the spine when I repeat it. <laughs> uh, but, but, it but, but that was, it was incredibly effective. It was like, you have to sort of take that off to the Tory campaign. It was very, very focused. It wasn't just that we had a terrible campaign, which we did. Theirs was a formidable campaign. Um, I recently reread their manifesto and I just say it's very odd message. It's, it's, it's just get Brexit done, unleash Britain's potential. Probably millions of times, I don't know, lots and lots of times within that, whereas Labour is like, here's a load of policy, like loads of things which aren't necessarily affordable. I think learning from that, uh, that, that sort of 2019 manifesto is really important. But from the Conservative side, the way I think they see this, and first of all, Labour needs to ask what the Conservatives are going to do and how they see this, and often we just think about what we're going to do. Actually, the first thing we should be doing is the Conservatives are in government, they're, they've got 90% of the power and control in this situation. They're dominating the agenda, as we'll see tomorrow, as we've seen for the past few days especially. And they're going to do everything in their power to, to win the next election. And that very much means holding on to that Brexit 2019 vote, especially in the North. Um, and bearing in mind that people didn't vote in 2017 and were mobilised to vote in 2019, they kind of need something more than, than I think they currently have. 
Now, that's why they've tried to manufacture culture wars to get people angry, because you do need a bit of anger, you need a bit of motivation to actually come out to vote for, for them again. And that's why they're sort of looking at the levelling up agenda. And what they'll try to do, I'd, I'd guess, because we can only guess, um, is to tell quite a powerful story about, um, as I've written the paper in review quite recently, in fact, around Labour neglecting these communities, the Tories starting to rebuild them, stick with us and we will... You need a story, you can't just have an issue. I think that's that's something that we need to understand about Brexit and about 2019, is it wasn't just an issue, it was a story, and the, the Tories were the sort of valiant hero of that story, much as it pains me to say, uh, and Johnson was you know, charging in to deliver the thing, um, to rescue us from the EU, in lots of people's view, perhaps not quite as sort of heroic as, as that, but you know what I mean, it was, that was effectively the way that they were looking at it, and Labour and loads of other people, uh, the, some certain elements of the media, judges even, they were the enemy, you know, enemies of the people, those sorts of things. It was very sort of, it was almost like a fairy tale, in a sense, if you look at the, the sort of structure. And very clever, Labour doesn't do very well at telling stories and needs to do much, much better in order to, to win the next election. I don't know how they're going to make the next election about Brexit as such. Um, but as I say, Brexit reflected something older in terms of decline of post-industrial towns, certainly in the north it did different in the south of course and so by time leveling up into that by crafting a story and narrative frame which sort of draws on that in a very powerful way they'll maximize the number of people who stick with them in the next election um, so i think yeah we need to also bear in mind of course that people probably won't make up their mind whether to stick with the tories or to come out vote labor or whatever probably until frustratingly late in the day for, for all of us who care so much about these things it'll probably be the week before a previous election, so anything to go by sometimes on the day. So we've got a long time to speculate about this, I'm afraid, probably right up to the election itself. But um, I think Labour just needs to primarily look at what the Conservatives are doing, respond to it, and then try to steal the initiative by sort of blunting anything that they're trying to do um, and developing their own positive alternative as well, which they, they are doing so far. Yeah, I think it's much less, I mean, it is about policies, but it's more about the story that the joined up policies tell. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually finished with questions now. Does any of you guys have any questions? Um, it would only have me in the room to kick off with. Uh, we've got two from Chris uh, on our chat. Chris is chair of a co chair of our economy and finance network with Amavir, uh, who is leading a project about rebuilding Labour's heartlands, so really super relevant, and it should be reporting, I think, early next year. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, so Chris has uh, two questions for you, so I might as well batch them together. The first is, you know, how can we build some good policy proposal, um, given that uh, some of the policy proposals will always end up targeting some areas more than others sort of how can we um yeah how, how can we make sure that any policies that labor have appeal to a wide range of seats and don't just target resources into a few um and the second question is how do you rate labor's chances for the next election following your research how many of the 150 seats do you think we can realistically win at the next general? Well, my past experience leads me to not answer that last question. I'm afraid I'm going to chicken out because um, I've been wrong in every sweepstake I've ever entered about the election. So um, I don't make predictions. Um, I, I do, I'm happy to analyse seats, but I think predicting the next election is, is a bit tricky. I think it's worth bearing in mind, though, that to deprive the Tories of the majority is relatively um, much easier, much, much easier than winning a majority outright. A majority outright is one heck of a swing. Um, but I think that, well, if you, if you assume uniform national swing, which is, to be, to be honest, a very, very um, dodgy assumption sometimes, um, but if you assume that, then it's about three percentage points, so three, three to four percentage points. And given how we did everything wrong at the last election in terms of how to win elections, you hope that, that is possible. Um, but then there's all sorts of options that throw themselves up at that point, as we know, particularly from 2015, um, how you know, they played off the SNP, for example, and what would happen in that situation. So we need to be aware that the kind of post-election set, the post-election conditions, the post-election sort of balance within Parliament, 
can influence the election itself and sort of have, a, have something ready to say about that as a top priority. Because we learned in 2015, of course, that we got tied up trying to answer that question about the SNP um, and, and Labour and coalitions and, and, and all that sort of stuff, when, which really deprived us of the opportunity to, to say much that was, was positive. Um, and the first point around um, policies that appeal to different places, I suppose, um, what we're trying to get across with, with this is a couple of things. And that's that, I guess, places shouldn't be defined necessarily or wholly by the majority of people living there, although it's a sort of, it's, it's good to sort of look at them. It's quite important to look at the diversity of those places as well. And so when you look at places that are sort of, I guess, spatially blind, as we call them, sort of policies which aren't targeted at particular geographies, like education and health tend to be relatively flat, if you will. They're not sort of um, spatially targeted at particular places. That those will benefit all people. So I mean, getting those things right is a really starting point. And um, things that appeal to sort of large sections of the population generally will tend to be a good thing to do as well because because they're quite well distributed. So when you look at social grades, which is um, an imperfect um, proxy for social class, um, you sort of C1, C2 voters, upper working class people, generally speaking, low middle class people, it's about half the population, very efficiently distributed across the country. And if you're appealing to those people, you're also appealing to lots of places. So some things are not sort of place-based, they're not spatial. Um, there are a lot of quite important things, which I think Labour often neglects, which are spatial and, and, are, um, and are focused on different places. And that's, of course, leveling up regional policy, transport infrastructure, um, which have been really neglected, I think, for, by both parties for a long time. Um, and the Tories have been able to mobilise that. They first tried it with the Northern Powerhouse, for those who remember it, um, and did a lot of work around that when it first came about in 2014. So they, it was almost a trial run, that. And obviously, Theresa May trials the, the, the lot of what Johnson's agenda in 2017. So it hasn't come from nowhere. A lot of this is, has built on um, the interventionism and the regional policies uh, of Osborne and later. Um, Labour had done some pretty good regional uh, regional policy when it went in government. It took a while to get there, but sort of towards the end, they started to set up combined authorities, although they passed the legislation to set up combined authorities. The RDAs were inventing, investing quite a lot of money, much more than the coalition did that followed them. Uh, and local enterprise partnerships are really weak, and the loads of the sort of architects, the Conservatives, well, they tore away what they were put in place and, and, and put things back in, in that were much weaker. So that agenda the Tories are obviously trying to fill now with a positive story, with a few bits of good news by the next election, because they won't really be able to turn it around. Um, but Labour, basically, I would say Labour needs to have a levelling up alternative uh, that's much more serious and much better set out. That's a, that's a serious plan compared to essentially playing political games which Conservatives are dealing with it. And that does involve an offer to, um, to rural communities and to London um, around regional policy to, to make the case for what, what does London need? Because actually London is one of the places that's hit hardest by regional inequality because house prices in London drive people into poverty in the capital more so than, than anywhere else. And many rural communities, which look really affluent to visit, I'm from Pembrokeshire and West Wales, and people often sort of think that oh, that's a, you know, everyone there is rich, right? No, actually, in lots of rural communities, particularly Cornwall, I should say, which is in the south, um, have a lot of really hidden poverty, um, which we overlook, I think. And I think Labour needs to understand the different types of poverty in different types of place. And we're actually starting a project on this happily, so we'll look out for news of that in about a month's time. Um, we'll be we'll be announcing a bit more on that, but looking at how all parts of the country can benefit from a more balanced economy um, because I do think that they can and that's the case that Labour needs to make to bring a sort of coalition of different seats together. And we've got a question. Yeah, cheers, thank you. Um, back being on from the Grand Chair. Um, thanks for the shout out of Dunmore. Um, we've got some great contributors in this room. Um, one question basically in the direction of the Labour Party and Fabian Society, along with the family unions, helped to create the Labour Party and this publication that you've led is more pertinent than ever. But with the repeal of Clause 4 and declining views of power and rising surface sector economy, does the Labour Party seem to lose its relevance in this day and age? How would you reply to that? So I think Labour's not adapted as well as it could do to, to changes that have happened in recent years. And these, these changes you know, they originate in the 80s and certainly 
from the 90s, you can start to see the decline in particular core voters. Um, and then various things happened, um, certainly from the 2000s onwards, that sort of pushed a lot of people away. So it's not a question of, I think, it's not the inevitability of Labour's decline in, uh, in a lot of these communities. It's how Labour's attitude in government, to be honest, often taking those people for granted. And those people got that message quite loud and clear, in fact. And they stopped voting Labour a long time ago, some of them, and then they um, were open to alternatives for a period of time as well. And that's sort of, that Labour didn't need to act the way they did about those communities when in government. They did a, a lot of good things for those communities, it is worth saying, um, whether that is the kind of policies that especially blinds are mentioned through tax credits and, and so on, which I think were, were, um, people forget how important those were to families growing up at that time. Um, and also through regionals. They did a lot of things for those communities, as of course did the, the EU, um, which we often forget to talk about and probably wisely don't mention these days, but the EU did a lot of investment in regional in, in regional policy in, in parts of the country which have, have left, uh, which, which didn't really thank them very often for it. But there is evidence to say that where the EU did invest, places were less against them slightly, still against them, but less against them than other places. Um, so, I suppose, yeah, that's the, the main point is that it wasn't inevitable. I can see, like, there's a sort of analysis which is like, well, we're not in an industrial economy, which is you know, capitalists versus workers, um, but it's not necessary that Labour should fail to adapt to a new set of situation, especially um, given that this new economy that we live in has all sorts of issues for trade unions and for Labour to be representing them on. I think Labour is actually, with those voters, often urban voters, particularly based in London, where you have the gig economy with all those sorts of issues, Labour's in some ways doing relatively well amongst that group. Um, they're just failing to bridge between that group and the older working class. And which is back to one of the questions that you asked, really. What, what is it that unites the, the younger working class and the older working class? Um, and that's, that's a very tricky question. But that, to me, is probably one of the big questions for Labour to find an answer to. Yeah, sure. yeah, so um, I'm, I'm from the southwest, um, the first village of the northeast Somerset, which is normally the seat they used to win to get the majority of the one. Um, but that calculation obviously includes what they won the seat in 2019, which isn't going to be the case. We've already lost half of what they got back in Sven. Um, so my question is kind of obviously, we've got to win seats beyond that yeah. to get the majority. Um, what kind of seat would Labour need to be looking at winning if they were going to win a majority? I mean, all of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, not all the seats, but all of the 150. I mean, like, that's, that's, that's kind of the point in many ways. Is So when you look at the nature of these seats, and you can see it within the, the charts there, where we sort of divided them into, into fifths, basically. We said into quintiles. So it's basically there's, you know, the, the most Brexit voting and the most Remain votes, most Leave votes, most Remain, and then everything in between. Um, and you can see that actually often the seats Labour holds currently are on one end, and the seats that the Tories hold currently are concentrated at one end, but also towards the middle in a lot of those. So the sort of battlegrounds are often within the middle in terms of very in terms of many things. In terms of geography in the country, they're quite central as well. You can see the sort of West Midlands, North, um, and, and parts of Wales as well, where a lot of these seats are. So it's kind of the middle. Why I kind of talk about the middle as being the, the core. And that cuts across seats with different political histories. So when you can focus on the, the sort of the one that we need to get over the line, um, as I said, like we can't we sort of implicitly assume a sort of uniform national swing to, to come up with 150 seats because that's just the sort of most defensible way of talking about it. But we know that actually there's going to be some curveballs in there. Some of those seats are going to move on further away from us, of course they are, and as you rightly say. Probably going to lose a load of seats too, um, where, especially where the Brexit party stood um, in Hartlepool um, and even back in Spain, which is probably closer than it could have been. Um, Hartlepool is probably a relatively good indicator, but by elections are always a bit, bit odd. But um, yeah, there are a lot of seats. I think we found about 20 with a, with a Labour majority of less than 5%, uh, a lot of them which um, uh, had the Brexit party standing. So, yes. Well, that's why that's kind of why we didn't look at 123 seats because that is technically the the point that Labour wanting to to win. We say you need to target 150, accounting for the fact that you're not going to win all of them and might lose a few as well. Absolutely, yeah. Go on, Mark. Uh, so actually, a question from the chat. So Jack Parker uh, has asked, 
I completely agree that Labour needs a story, not just a bunch of disconnected policies. Do you have any idea what that story needs to be to win a wide variety of people? That's a million dollar question. It is a million dollar question. Um, I'm tempted to have a stab, but um, I think I think they are developing a story. And I think um, I'll plug the uh, Starmer pamphlet, of course. You started to tell a story there. Um, I mean, doing the job, but no, he's started to plug a story there. And also in, in, in his speech, in fact, which obviously he got criticised for being too long, but he spent a good chunk of it telling his personal story. I think that is important, you know, stories are characters and Starmer is telling us who he is. Um, Johnson is a character as well, and that's, that's another different, very different, but you know, you do need to establish a character to tell the story. I think that's, that's part of it. What that story is, you can see that they're sort of, at the moment at least, um, leaning on the pandemic as being a sort of bifurcation, of being like a point where we can go down one path and it's you know, the way things were or worse, or a better path with Labour. And that's the kind of the story or the decision that they're presenting and it'd be interesting to see if that holds, because I, I feel that a lot of people will probably want to forget the pandemic ever happened once it's gone and won't want to see that as a reference point at all. So you kind of do need those sorts of things. You, you need to have that element, that inflection point within, within the story. So I don't think that will necessarily be a story by the next election, because currently it's a story they're trying to tell now, which is, which is probably a good idea. Um, but what will it be at the next election? You've got to think two years in advance, and I think they need to be ready with the with the elements there of that story to, to tell um, within the sort of years, months and years before the election. Um, hard to tell at this point though, because we are in a very odd situation at the moment, as people will know. Yeah, yeah. My question is actually um, similar to Jack's, and I think it's quite interesting. You're mentioning Luke that the sort of leadership started to formulate the response to levelling up at conference, which was focusing on social mobility and also Labour's previous record in government as sort of an early example of leveling up but how can we actually make this sort of more modern so because i think often people see labor and we're sort of talking about previous achievements in government but it doesn't seem the most future facing in the government to say we're funneling all this investment into these communities across the country as we speak how do we kind of compete with that in the story that we're developing and frame it in a more compelling way so people actually believe it it's a very good question i think um yeah, they need to sort of find, find a balance between being proud of what they achieved in, in government, but not dwelling on it too much, not leaning on it too hard. And, and you're right, absolutely needs to, to look forward. And as I say, the first thing to ask is what's the government going to be doing? As you say, they're going to be funneling cash into these communities. What does Labour say in response? And I think often in response to the predecessor agenda, which you mentioned, um, the Northern Powerhouse agenda, Labour just seemed to want it to fail rather than saying we would do this differently. And people get that, they, they, they get the tone of that, and they think, well, even most people, and Northerners aren't daft, you know, they weren't like, George Osborne's going to solve all my problems, I'll vote for him. <laughs> Not quite how it works, but they did see, they sort of, oh, right, okay, so, sorry, chance to try to do something, probably won't happen, but at least he's trying, is this sort of immediate response, I think, so let's take a stab at that. And I think likewise with, with levelling up, it will, that will be what they're aiming for, is, you know, is, to, is for someone to give them the benefit of the doubt, of what they've done so far, there's some indication where it's going to go. They're not going to be able to transform those economies um, by that time. So I think Labour needs to have, we can't focus only on policy, as I say. You do need the policy, but you need to tell a story about it. They, but they do need the policy in the first instance. And um, trying to talk, develop that policy and then some of the other work that we're doing, which I mentioned, and sort of presenting, you know, that Labour's got a plan and the Conservatives are just you know, a bit chaotic about a lot of these things and it just, and it doesn't seem to be working. I think the problem with the conservative approach, which they may find, is that, say, take a high street, which is obviously very politicised at the moment, a high street of any town in the north, that was Lancashire or you know, parts of Yorkshire, that high street is not an island. It doesn't exist independent of the wider economy in which it sits. And so a lot of their plan is to sort of hanging baskets and cobbles and high, let's start up the high street, right? Because people will vote for it today. But what if people aren't coming into the high street because they don't have enough money um, because the wider economy is sinking? And uh, again, why it's unfashionable to say, Brexit is hammering those economies. It really is. And that's not for Labour to say, you know, it's certainly not to say, I told you so, because that's not, not a good look. But like, there, there is, the, the communities that voted to leave the EU are the ones that will be hit harder by, by Brexit and are being hit by Brexit right now. Um, we, we need to be careful though, because the, the places that 
saw the lowest employment and house price changes, the sort of worst performing economic places under the Tories from 2010 onwards, when and voted Tory in large number. So places don't, it's not that the sort of decline of a place leads for people to vote against that government. In fact, often they vote for it. It's, it doesn't work quite like that, as much as we'd quite like to sort of imagine there's a kind of mechanistic push from people saying, oh, I don't like what the government's done to this. They're, they're blaming to all these, it's like the economy stupid saying and so on, but it actually doesn't work like that. Certainly when Brexit comes into, into the picture, but it's not the only thing. And people don't just vote according to their economies, they vote according to lots of different things. So it's, yeah, as you can tell, quite a difficult yeah. answer to, to give. But, um, <laughs> but uh, the first step is to um, see the problem, see what the Tories are doing, and then develop a, an alternative agenda that's positive and not just sort of cast on the sidelines as sometimes it can be. Uh, is it possible to think that we kind of have the answer already somewhat uh, in the metro mayors, at least in the north, uh, and using them to cut through as a kind of answer to this levelling up uh, agenda uh, as a very localised, place-based answer, and is there any risk uh, in using them more and care bringing them in as a big voice for regions um, and seeing them as competing rather than a collective, kind of not all nations we say, but a collective voice? Uh, yeah, I completely agree that um, mayors are in a really good position to to, to drive a lot of this because um, so one of the things we saw in Wales in the elections earlier in the year was sort of things seem to visibly represent the place that you, you live and what you represent um, is very powerful and can bring people back from voting the Tories and voting to leave to actually vote Labour in Wales very often. And I'd speculate, and only speculate at this point, that that sort of effect could be achieved where there are metro mayors in, in England as well. Um, and Andy Burnham's sort of speech on you know, Bridgewater Hall down the road from here um, was, was quite a moment um, in, in the last year, and that really did cut through. It's incredibly popular in the city region. Um, every single ward in the whole of Greater Manchester voted for Andy Burnham in the earlier election, in the election earlier this year, every single one. A lot voted for him a few years ago as well, almost all of them. So if you have hundreds and hundreds of wards, Voted for for Andy Burnham in conservative, cons in conservative constituency, conservative boards, where they otherwise elected conservative councillors, they voted for Andy. So there's absolutely something to be learned from from there. And in terms of how Labour needs to sort of manage that, the sort of tension as you as you need to, um, they absolutely need to be on the same team. I think they are, but that needs to perhaps be a bit more visible that they are working to the same agenda, to the same um, to the, to the, on the same team, and hopefully towards an election, of course. That would be quite powerful. I think that Labour absolutely needs to benefit, needs to, to, to push their mayors to the front. I should say, though, that as I mentioned earlier, about half of the 125 seats in, in England and Wales are sort of not adjacent to the core city. So some of them are within Greater Manchester, but very few are actually. A lot of them are outside of places where Labour have a mayor, unfortunately. So there's the London Wales, obviously, there's a Welsh Labour government. And there are a couple of couple in the sort of towns just outside of, um, well, just within Greater Manchester, but just outside Manchester. But a lot of the seats Labour needs to win do not have a Labour mayor. So that leads to the question: Can could they use prominent figureheads to speak up on behalf of places they don't technically represent? So you've seen them to do that quite a lot. It's talking about the north sometimes. You've got Tracy now in, in West Yorkshire, if you do similar, and Steve Robin, of course, to an extent as well. So they're sort of taking on that broader role and getting a lot of recognition for it. I think that is quite an important part of Labour's election campaign, yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> one thing that I've noticed, especially like in my experience of door knocking, is that there's been almost this aspect of voters feeling sorry for Boris Johnson and the government, um, feeling that they've been you know, hard done by this pandemic and that you know, they've tried the best they could. How do we effectively in 2024 in like you know these narratives counter people just feeling sorry for Boris and almost giving him a pity vote? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think <laughs> um I know what you mean because yeah, I feel like I've heard the saying and I think there, there's a, there's some research and focus groups certainly that would that have found people almost give them the benefit of the doubt. And some of that is is very understandable and fair. I think that's important to sort of step back from it and sort of try and be as non-partisan about it as possible. Um Obviously, the government's got a dire record in terms of handling the pandemic. Don't get me wrong, but the idea that, you know, in general terms, that when you sort of see something like a pandemic come along, 
you should give the people in charge a bit of a sort of a bit of a break in dealing with it. I think that is a kind of normal and understandable reaction. I think obviously the Tories handling of the pandemic has gone way beyond what is tolerable. Um, but I think people's instinct is to sort of give them a bit of a break, and that's a that's a kind of natural instinct. Will that be the same sentiment in Essex? I'd say, well, luckily for Labour, and <laughs> fortunately not. I don't think people will be thinking about the pandemic at the next election, um, for better and worse, for from Labour's perspective. I'm not sure how. I mean, what will they be talking about instead? We don't know. But hopefully, we'll all this will be a bad memory, um, and you know, I uh, like 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 many things in the past. I remember my my uni days. It all was compressed into sort of one mad night in Manchester and the pandemic will be compressed into sort of one day at home. It will feel like one sort of consolidated thing that people just won't want to think about that, I, I, I suspect. Um, so without that, what will Johnson be? He'll be um, charging around the country saying, look what we've built. This is what we'll build next. I think that's probably most likely to be what they'll do, but you know, we'll, we'll see. They're, they're very good at what they're doing at the moment. I think it's probably worth Saying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mark, have we got some questions from the Facebook? Yeah, we've got a couple of um, last questions from the Zoom. Uh, so um, Chris has asked a couple of questions. I think one you've partly answered already, so we can probably move over that, which is what about the seats which have been swinging away from Labour and they almost lost to the Tories or other parties at the last election? I think you basically answered that. A lot of them just had a higher share of the Brexit Party's vote and Reform yeah. UK isn't. Um, matching up to that. His other question was, what lessons do you think we can draw from the SPD's recent victory? So maybe uh, you can talk about that one and we've got another question from Cecilia after that as well. Uh, if, uh, I just, there's a few things I've drawn from SDP, but I, I should say I'm not an expert in geopolitics, but I think they did take fiscal credibility um, in the right direction. I think they did quite well with that. Probably also worth noting that they didn't win the kind of majorities that used to win, win when they did win elections indeed. So there, there is a limitation to what Labour can learn from them um, because they did win, so what was it, 27% in the end? I forgot. The polls were sort of between 25 and 27% of the vote. Labour needs to win a lot more than that. Um, so yeah, a tricky one, um, but I think sometimes, um, it's very um, German perhaps to say, but sort of not, we're often on the left and particularly party members um, we want a bit of a vision and we want someone to be sort of compelling and dynamic and so on. And, you know, Schultz is not those things in, in that particular way. Um, perhaps the public sometimes wants someone who's uh, less exciting and a bit more, you know, just exudes competence, um, which is boring for his party members sometimes, but also could help to win elections, I think. So that's what I speculate we can learn from them, although two different countries, very different in many ways. Um, two of the most similar countries in some ways, but also very different. And so it's limited what we can learn, but I'd say those two things are perhaps. Yes, can I go with Cecilia's question? Absolutely. So Cecilia's is a bit about um, strategy and narrative and what course corrections we might need to make from what Labour's currently trying. Uh, so she says, great presentation, thank you. What do you think is our biggest obstacle at the moment in our narrative? And what do you think the best ways to mitigate it? It's very tricky to, um, to be honest, to say what Labour should be doing differently because they, they are doing most things you'd recommend doing at the moment. So people will complain that Labour didn't have enough policy. They've got hundreds, <laughs> they've got a lot of policy. There's, there's no shortage of policy. And there wasn't really ever one, it just didn't seem to cut through, and I just think if that is part of the problem, perhaps you could say that they sort of didn't stick to, you know, re-announcing the same policy like the Tories do, perhaps they could do that a little bit more and learn from them. Um, and I think as well, I don't know, it's a, it's a tricky one, what I advise them to do differently. I think as well, we, we, sort of, we didn't know Starm, I think a lot of people out there were saying, um, you know, we don't know about him, who is he, like what does he stand for? And obviously, particularly with uh, Fabian Pamphlet, but also his uh, party conference speech. Um, he more than he told us too much, if anything. We really know Keir Starmer now, so no one can say either of those things anymore. I think 
they, they have in some sense course corrected, but also I'd suggest perhaps they did those things at the right time. You know, there, there was a pandemic on. It wasn't really the time to be announcing loads of policy. Um, and it wasn't really the time to be sort of giving the kind of speech that Starmer gave at party conference recently. Perhaps, you know, perhaps they have a strategy even, and perhaps they're delivering to that strategy. And I think often, particularly on Twitter, which I mentioned for the last time, um, particularly on Twitter, um, people like to sort of play backseat driver and they like to say, oh, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Obviously, sometimes they are right, and it's important to sort of them to take that on board when they are, but they're not daft. I think you know, that these are, these, are, these are pretty good people. Um, around the table at the top of the party, thankfully, it's not always been the case. So I'm saying more about that, but you know, it's not always been the case that the people at the top of the party have been some of the brightest people, some of the most experienced people in British politics, and we have that now. So I don't know. I think they're probably heading in the right direction, um, and yeah, while they will need to course correct, they will make mistakes. I think broadly they've got the the best approach at the moment, which doesn't look very good from outside very often because it is so damn hard when you've got a government in the position that they are doing the things that they're doing and I think tomorrow we'll see even more of that it's really tricky we'll see it in a physical form we'll have you know the chance of delivering a, a spending review and a budget it's time we're just gonna have to stand up and respond to it on the spot like that if, if ever you wanted a moment that's going to encapsulate the sort of asymmetry of the current situation with the Tory government basically using the machinery of government to campaign then it's going to be tomorrow but that won't be the only time you'll have that for the next couple of years as well, using every you know, every element of the state to essentially campaign for the Tory majority in the next election. That's the situation. There's no use complaining about it. Um, but I think perhaps understanding and sympathising with the fact that the leadership have a very difficult task ahead of them and giving them a bit of the benefit of the doubt sometimes is, is quite important. Yeah. Um, are there any last questions from anyone in the room? Oh, Mark, yeah. If not, then, um, I'll, I'll tell you. First of all, well, thank you so much. It's been a really great presentation. The report's fantastic. Definitely urge everyone to go and read the whole thing on the Fabian's website. Um, I was thinking about Batley and Spen and Hartley Pool, the by elections that you mentioned. And it seems to me that where Labour got something right, it was in Batley and Spen going with a local candidate who wasn't necessarily you know, the most dedicated internal Labour Party candidate, but somebody who was well known in the constituency, very local, was able to spin a great narrative. Um, and in Hartlepool, it feels like we we saw a, the success of an independent candidate who was quite similar in some ways. And Sam Lee, who got something like 10% of the vote, a local businesswoman who's been really active civically in Hartlepool. And it seems like people are kind of hungry for local candidates who do show that civic pride. So do you think there's something that Labour could do to help win some of these seats by changing the approach to selecting candidates and looking a little bit outside the usual Labour circles and to local communities and people who have that track record there? Very good question. I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a uh... Anecdotally, and I don't know the evidence specifically on this, I think, and particularly under when Labour was in government, the feeling that people were being parachuted in played very badly, I think, in a lot of, of communities. And I suspect there's evidence that that you know, will have contributed to a broader narrative about taking places for granted. So, broadly speaking, quite important to have um, local, uh, local. It's not not always the, the best candidates, of course. It, it doesn't, it's not that you necessarily need to be from that place, or need to be even based in that place to be a good MP. It's not to say that. But does it count for something? Absolutely, I think it, it probably does. And the best thing that the party can do is to probably avoid doing that, of course, avoid parachuting people in, um, but also select candidates much more quickly than I think they currently plan to do. Because uh, uh, the Conservatives, I believe, have selected all their candidates, of course. They, well, they, I think Michael Gove said this, and don't quote me on this, but I did see a, something leaked from part, Tory party conference, which I disagree with, but they've, they've already got their people in. Yeah. Of course, a lot of them are already MPs. Win. Um, and that's what happens when you win, is you've got a load of incumbent MPs, so you don't need to worry about selecting new candidates. But, um, but that's it, that's, I suppose that's part of the answer as well, is that the Tories' candidates are going to be the established MPs who are going to have been campaigning for several years before Labour's even got a candidate in place. 
I don't know what the timescales are for the current selection, to be honest with you, but maybe other people in the room do. Um, but uh, it feels like probably accelerating those might be a good idea, especially given the challenge that we've got to overturn a lot of incumbent MPs, really. Yeah, I know the Lib Dem selected their candidate for St Albans, yeah. uh, and then she around the 2017 election didn't win, but continuously campaigned for the next two years and pulled off a little bit of a shock by uh, unseating a Conservative there by just, well, not a very Conservative incumbent, but she really used the time effectively. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that's another point, I suppose, is sometimes we're reluctant to learn from other parties. And, you know, I know they're different parties and we disagree on many things, but sometimes they run good campaigns. So let's steal from them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that. It's, uh, it works. Um, do it for the reason. Absolutely. Is there any last questions or anything? Okay, is there anything you want to say? No, thank you. You've pretty much asked everything that Prof has asked. <laughs> 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 Which I really appreciate. And thank, thanks for having, having me. And a special thanks to Young Fabian's for hosting something in Manchester. It's, as someone who's adopted this place in my home, it's really good to have events going on here. Um, that not as many happen here as should happen here. I think it's fair to say, given that it's a big city, many more events should happen here. And I'm really grateful to Young Fabian's for contributing to that and coming up here for inviting me to speak. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming up. Um, anyone who wasn't at home, please follow the Young Fabian Twitter, the newsletters, sign up if you're not a member. If you go to the University of Manchester, please come to the AJ on Thursday as well. But yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amy.